Good evening, everyone. Good evening. Today is going to be our last uh, segment on characteristics of a leader. Segment 10, or chapter 10 from my book, The Characteristics of a Leader, or The Character of a Leader. Next week, we'll be venturing into my book, Uprooting the Spirit of Rejection and abandonment. So those that are dealing with rejection or abandonment, um, there are some great tools in my book. The book basically tells a lot about my experience in going through abandonment, which uh, birthed the rejection or the emotion uh, re of rejection uh, that I dealt with. Um, so living uh, this out in my own life is giving me the wisdom and through the spirit of God, the ability to write a book to help others uh, uproot that spirit and rejection in their life to where they can carry on. Most people don't realize and understand that there are the rejection and abandonment that we may have went through um, as kids are growing up still affects us in our adulthood. So as we are able to uproot uh, this abandonment and rejection in our lives, we're able to pass on to our children a more healthier way of living and being to where they can be successful and live out the purpose in which they have uh, been blessed with uh, by our Lord and Savior. So today being the last chapter, we're going to be talking about confidence. Confidence. Over the last 13 weeks, we've gone over different characteristics, but with these characteristics, there's they, they, they can't be upheld if you don't have the confidence within yourself that you can actually do it, that you can actually do it. See, confidence is the foundation of leadership. It's the cornerstone upon which all else is built. So without the foundation of confidence, all the other things are characteristics can't be built in making you a great leader, a great leader. Now, many uh, relationship uh, fundamentals can be taught. There's a lot of things uh, uh, as far as leadership fundamentals that can be taught to you. Uh, problem solving skills, uh, uh, um, decisiveness, uh, how to coach others, uh, and, and effective communication, and, and there's many more. However, Unless the leader believes in themselves first, these other skills will not be as effective. So what am I saying? I'm glad you asked. You must believe in yourself. Believe that you can do it. Believe that you are a leader. And if you are a male, you were born to be a leader. God set you up to lead. Lead in your family. Lead in your community. Lead at your job, you are a leader. Now, in my book, I talk about something that uh, many people don't really talk about, and that's low confidence. We talk about low self-esteem, but many people have low confidence in themselves that they can't. One of the things I want you to do is I want you to erase can't out of your vocabulary because all things are possible through Christ who strengthens you. All things are possible. So get the can't out of your vocabulary. Stop using can't because all you're doing is setting yourself up for failure. Now, in my book, I wrote this pertaining to low self-confidence. It says low self-confidence leads to second guessing, micromanaging, and an overall lack of trust in one's own ability. On the other hand, leaders with high confidence tend to be more successful because they can take risks, delegate authority, and make decisions without overthinking. Have you ever had a, a leader or a supervisor or someone that wanted to do everything themselves? And some people think it's because they want to get all the credit, but sometimes is that they have a low self-confidence and, 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 or excuse me, uh, 
uh, uh, yeah, well, a, a low self-confidence, and they don't want anyone else to steal their glory. They don't want anyone else to steal their glory. You know, a person with high confidence, they're going to delegate. They're going to delegate. A good leader is going to delegate authority to others. See, one of the things I understand about leadership is I'm not, I, I'm a leader, but I want many leaders. And what I mean by that is individuals who have a talent in doing something or have the knowledge in doing something or, 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 or it's, it's, it's a skill that they, they, they are good in and give them the ability or the authority to go out and do what it is that they do best. And let me tell you something, people that are able to do what they do best, the person that is doing that they are going to give it their all. Why? Because it's something they love to do. Has somebody ever told you to do something that you didn't like doing? Or maybe you didn't have the ability or the skill or the knowledge to do? You don't want to do that because you don't have the confidence within yourself that you can do it and do it uh, 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 with your all. OK, but if you are able to do something that, you know, you're good and you're confident that you're good in, you're going to appreciate the ability of being able to do that. And you're going to give it your all. Why? Because you know that you are good at it, that you are good at it. All right. Now, here's a few things that can affect a leader's confidence. Here's a few things that can affect a leader's confidence. Past experience. Past experience. I wrote in my book this. It says a leader's confidence is often shaped by their past experiences. If they have had success in the past, they are more likely to feel confident about their ability to lead in the future. On the other hand, if they have had failures, they may be less likely to take risks and be more cautious in their decision making. Either way, leaders, a leader's past experience can significantly impact their confidence level and ability to lead effectively. Have you ever done something and it was a flop? And then you come back and you have to do it again. What's going to play in your mind is what happened in the past. And what that's going to do is it's going to affect your emotions and you're going to stumble. Why? Because you're focused on what happened in the past instead of looking at what can happen in the future. Just because you failed at it in the past doesn't mean that you're a failure in it. It just means maybe you got to critique some things or do some things a little bit different, a little bit different. There's many people that have failed but they've come back to do the same thing and they've succeeded. Why? Because they had the confidence within themselves that if I make a couple of tweaks, I can make this thing work and be successful in it. Number two, personality traits. These are some things here that uh, uh, can affect a leader's confidence. Your personality traits. I wrote this in my book. A leader's confidence is often affected by their personality traits. For example, an extraordinary, extraordinary leader may feel more confident when addressing a large group, while an introvert leader may feel more confident leading one-on-one -on -one interactions. Similarly, a natural optimistic leader may find it easier to maintain their confidence during challenging times while a leader who tends to be more pasmatic may find it more difficult. Ultimately, a leader's confidence level will likely uh, fluid, fl fluidicate, I'm sorry, ultimately a leader's confidence level may, may fluctuate depending upon their personality trait and their specific situation. However, leaders can learn to manage their reaction and better navigate challenging situations by understanding how their personality affects their confidence. So if you're an introvert, you may react 
differently than an extrovert. You know, you may feel more comfortable working with someone one on one instead of being out in front of a group of individuals, a group of individuals. Let me tell you, I can remember uh, the first time that I had to get up and speak uh, in a church and uh, it was frightening. I was sweating. I Man, I, I sweat my whole suit off. But the thing is, I went through it. I went through it. I did halfway decent but I didn't give up. And from me not giving up and going through it, even though I had to fight through the fear, when I went up another time, it was a lot easier. Why? Because I had more confidence in myself, in myself and what it was that I was doing. Number three, support systems. I wrote a leader's confidence is also often affected by the support systems they have in place. If a leader feels like they have a strong supportive team behind them, they are more likely to feel confident about the ability to lead. On the other hand, if a leader feels isolated and alone, they may find it more difficult to maintain their confidence. Now, what I'm going to do, I'm going to move to marriages here, and I'm going to speak to the men and the women, the wife and the husband. Wife, it's a must that you support your husband because as you support your husband, what it's going to do is it's going to build his confidence. And same with the husband, support your wife in the things that they may be uh, moving forward in because it's going to build their confidence. When you're in a relationship, you must support, you must build up, not tear down that other individual because it's going to affect their confidence in what they do, in what they do. Now, if it's in the workplace, your team, your team must support you. As your team backs you and supports you, you have more confidence and to go lead to go lead. Now, if you have a team that does not support you and you feel like you're on a, an island all by yourself, the confidence level has decreased and you're not able to do the things in which you are intending to do. OK, that's number three. Number four, self-awareness, self-awareness. Now, in my book, I wrote this. A leader's self-awareness can greatly influence how confidence they feel. If a leader knows their strengths and weaknesses, they can be more confident in their ability to lead. Similarly, if a leader is aware of the impact their words and action have on others, they can be more confident in their ability to communicate and inspire. On the other hand, if a leader is blinded by ego or are unaware of how their behaviors impact others, they may come across an arrogant or unpre they may come across arrogant or unprepared, which can erode confidence. In short, a leader's self-awareness is essential for maintaining confidence. By understanding themselves and those around them, leaders can exude the calm, assuring uh, assurance that comes with true confidence. So what am I saying? I'm saying this, that it's important, and we read this in, uh, I think it was chapter four, it's, it's, it's important that you understand your weaknesses as well as your strengths so that you can understand the whole you. See, what we want to do is we, wanna, we want people to see our strengths, but we are focused on our weaknesses. And if we focus more on our weaknesses, it's going to affect our confidence level in what we are trying to achieve. So as you are able to focus more so on your strengths, as well as knowing your weaknesses, you're able to maneuver and move effectively and move effectively. Now, in any leadership role, whether it be work, whether it be community, whether it be family, doesn't matter. It is essential to be aware of the various factors that can undermine your confidence. This is what happens when you don't pay attention to those confidence killers. It will lead you to reduce productivity in the workplace, 
your productivity level of your team may go down, uh, decreased moral, morale, excuse me, morale. And with that, you know, the morale, the people aren't coming around you, supporting you, uh, uh, moving forward with you. And even it can cause burnout. It can cause burnout. So you want to make sure that you are uh, 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 moving in confidence and not low confidence because it can affect many areas uh, of your team or even in your home. You know, as a, as a man and the head of the home or a single mom uh, 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 being the head of her home, she has to be confident so that uh, he or she can keep the morale up in the house uh, and keep the productivity in the house moving in a forward direction. Okay. Now, to lead effectively, it is crucial to identify and overcome these factors in which you may be dealing with. Now, here are some common confidence killers. In uh, excuse me, hold, hold on. Here, here are some common confidence killers uh, that can cause some havoc in your job, in your relationship, and even if you're a community leader in the community. And take your leadership levels to take your leadership uh, to the next level. Okay. So in my book, I wrote this. I wrote about preparation, lack of preparation. So a lack of preparation is one of the biggest confidence killers, not being prepared. I can tell you firsthand uh, in ministering, you know, not being prepared for the service uh, in a way that you felt, you know, I felt comfortable in, um, it, it, it would affect the confidence that I had in delivering the message in which I was to deliver. But when I had prepared and I had the confidence in what it was that I was uh, moving forward in, <clears throat> you know, things went smoothly. Okay, it's either okay. So where was that? If you don't feel prepared for a task, it won't be easy to have confidence in your ability to complete it. Before taking on any new challenges, make sure you take the time to prepare yourself fully. Research, research the task at hand. Create a plan and practice as much as possible. The more prepared you are, the more confident you will feel. Have any of you gone through that? Maybe your boss is giving you a task to do and it was something that you weren't familiar with and 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 you really weren't prepared. Uh, how did that make you feel? I mean, did you have the confidence that you would be able to do it compared to the fact of doing something or being given a task that uh, maybe you had talent and skills in and 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 and. and you, you feel a little bit more confident because you knew or you know what you're doing. It's like it's like walking, walking blind, you know, walking blind compared to walking with your eyes open. OK, number two, number two is the imposter syndrome. These are confidence killers. These are things that will take and kill your confidence in what it is that you are trying to do. So imposter syndrome. Now, the imposter syndrome I wrote in my book is the feeling that you are not good enough or not or do not deserve success. Many people suffer from this. They don't feel like they're good enough to do what it is that they're doing. They've been put in a leadership role and they feel like they're not good enough or they don't deserve it. This can be a major confidence killer making you second guess your ability and doubt your accomplishment. If you find yourself feeling like an imposter, remind yourself of all the hard work you've put in and all the progress you've made. It's also helpful to talk to someone you trust about your feelings of imposter syndrome. They can help provide some much needed perspective and remind you you are worth it. I'm going to say that again and remind you, 
you are worth it, okay? There has to be a reason why a supervisor says, I want to promote you. There must be a reason why uh, uh, the community says, we want to make you the spokesperson for the community. There must be a reason. But if you feel like you uh, uh, don't deserve it, then you're not going to move with the confidence needed to fulfill uh, that title or that position. Perf perfectionalism. Perfectionalism is another common confidence killer. You'll likely never feel confident or good enough if everything you do has to be perfect. Remember that nobody is perfect and that's okay. It's okay to make mistakes. Instead of feeling like everything you do needs to be perfect, focus on doing your best and learning from your mistakes. Focus on doing your best and learning from your mistakes. I was talking to one of the guys in our transitional house. He just got out of prison and uh, he's new to uh, the Seattle area, doesn't know his way around. And he was telling me that he had gotten lost two or three times. And I remember I told him, I said, you know what? Getting lost is a good thing because the area you got lost in, I guarantee you, you will never forget. And so you know that area now. Why? Because you got lost in it. So not every negative thing is a bad thing. We can learn something from every negative thing that goes on in our life. Number four, fear of failure. And that's a big one. That's a big one. You know, a lot of people are comfortable or they know how to deal with failure. They know how to be in, uh, they know how to be at the bottom of the barrel. They've been there. Okay. But when you excel and exceed a place that you've never been before, that fear of failure comes in. Like you're going to go back down to that place that you never want to go to again. I wrote in my book this. Fear of failure is another common confidence killer. If you're afraid to fail, you may be less likely to take risks or try new things. Instead of letting fear hold you back, remind yourself that failure is necessary for growth. I'm going to say that again. Failure is necessary for growth. Embrace your mistakes and use them as opportunities to learn and to grow. Use them as opportunities to learn and to grow. Now, these are confidence killers. These are things that will take the confidence that you had and poke a hole in it, okay? Lack of preparation, the imposter syndrome, perfectionalism, being a perfectionist, and fear of failure. Now, let's take a look at things that will build your confidence, things that will build your confidence. Number one, set attainable goals for yourself. One of the best ways to build confidence is to set an achievable small goal. When you accomplish a goal, no matter how small, it will give you a boost of confidence that you can use to tackle bigger challenges. Setting attainable goals also helps to build momentum. This can be a great way to break out of a confidence rut. Okay, set small goals for yourself. You know, a bunch of small goals leads to a big step. Number two, focus on your strengths, not your weaknesses. Okay, I wrote this. When you know your strengths, you can use them to your advantage and feel more confident in your abilities. Spend some time identifying your strengths and brainstorming ways to use them more often. So those things that you are strong in, you want to use those more often than trying to use something that you're weak in. And that's what we do. We try to use something that we're weak in to try to build it as a strength. And what happens at times is we fail. And that 
affects our confidence. So focus on your strength. Number three, surround yourself with supportive people. Surround yourself with supportive people. People who believe in you and trust your abilities are a great source of confidence. Be intentional about maintaining these relationships. With a strong support system, you'll find more confident taking risks, trying new things, and leading others. Okay, so surround yourself by people that will support you, that will cheer for you. Get rid of the haters and the doubters. Surround yourself by people that support you. Number four, learn from your mistakes. Important. Learn from your mistakes. Don't, 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 don't dwell upon the mistake you made, but look at what could I have done to prevent the mistake. It says this in my book. No one is perfect and everyone makes mistakes. The key is to learn from your mistakes and use them as opportunities to grow. Don't dwell on it or beat yourself up when you make a mistake. Instead, take a step back, reflect on what happened and what you could have done differently. Then use that knowledge to move forward and do better the next time and do better the next time. I remember when I was in recovery and I had a relapse problem. I just kept relapsing and I would always see what I should have done, but I wouldn't apply what I should have done the next time around. But when I got to a place to where enough was enough and I began to put all these things together and see the things that I made a mistake on and what I should have done. And when I began to apply those things, things changed for my life. Things changed for my life. Number four. Five, step out of your comfort zone. Huge. This is huge. We get comfortable. And as we get comfortable, we want to stay in that comfortable bubble. We don't want to go outside of that bubble. What I wrote in my book is this. A comfort zone is a behavioral space where an individual experiences little or no stress. It is a familiar place where we feel safe and everything is predictable. Individuals tend to operate within their comfort zone most of the time because it requires minimal effort and feels secure. However, a leader cannot grow or develop by staying within their comfort zone. You must be willing to step out of your comfort zone to grow and build confidence. Doing so will also help you become more adaptive innovative, and resilient. As you step out of your comfort zone, you will be able to experience more things which will build more confidence. You will be able to do and experience more things which will build more confidence, which will build more confidence. All right. All right. Now, in my book, I went to the Bible. I went to Philippians 4 and 13, where it says, I can do all things through Christ that strengthens me. I can do all things through Christ that strengthens me. And in my book, I wrote, it is often quoted as a source of inspiration and strength, that scripture. However, it is also important to remember that this verse is not just about overcoming difficult obstacles in the context of leadership. It's about having the confidence to lead others and to make a difference in the world. This confidence comes from knowing that we are not alone, nor our efforts and that God's power is available to us to help us succeed. Now, for those believers as well as non-believers or whatever you believe in, just understand this, that whatever power, the universe, whatever you want to call it, know that the power is available to you to help you succeed. So you're not doing it alone. You have that entity 
to give you the extra um that you need to make it happen, to make it happen. All right. So we're going to go to the assessment questions now. As I state after every uh, chapter we read, at the end of each chapter, there's five questions. Uh, there's no right or wrong answer because we're all different. So uh, number one, are you a confident leader? Do you have confidence in your leadership? Do you feel that you are a confident leader? Do you sometimes find yourself lacking confidence? If so, what do you think are the main reasons for this? What's the reason behind it? Number three, what are some things you can do to build confidence? What are some things that you can do to build your confidence up, to make you a more confident leader? Number four, how might a lack of confidence affect your ability to lead effectively? How might a lack of confidence affect you, your ability to lead your family, to lead your team at the job, to lead in your community? Number five. What is one area in which you would like to become more confident? As I stated, after each chapter of my book, we have assessment questions that you can look within yourself and answer these questions. And from those answers, be able to look at moving forward in building your confidence or whatever chapter you may be answering the questions in. Now, as I stated this, is our last chapter of the character of a leader. Next week, we'll be going into uh, my book, Uprooting the Spirit of Rejection and Abandonment. So if you know anyone that is dealing with abandonment issues or rejection issues, and a lot of women, a lot of women, I, and I, re I'm re I really want to speak to the women right now because, you know, uh, 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 as young girls say high school, you, you go out with a guy and then you guys break up, you break your heart and then you go out with another guy. And maybe during high school, you go out with six or seven guys, you know, and that rejection. And then you go to college or whatever the case and that rejection, you know, and maybe you're married two or three times and that rejection and and men, the same thing, you know, so. You know, and, 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 and let's take it further back, you know, even maybe in childhood where you felt abandoned, that you weren't getting the, the time and the support and things that, you know, all these things affect us. They're little wounds that affect us and they affect our behavior and they affect our attitudes. So I would uh, state to you, if you know anyone that is going through any abandonment issues or rejection issues, have them tune in next Tuesday, six o'clock, same time, same place. We're going to be moving in the book, Uprooting the Spirit of Rejection and Abandonment. Again, for those that have uh, followed for the last 13 weeks, I appreciate it. I hope that you've received some tools to, uh, to help you to be more of an effective leader in your home, being a single mother with your child, uh, in the job as you are a supervisor or a team lead or whatever you may be, and in your community. You know, leadership is all over the place. And we as men, we must grab a hold of these tools today because many men are not walking according to who they were purposed to be. And that's being a leader. So until next week, God bless you. We'll see you then.